than so. And we are being recorded. Um, and I also work as a um, director at Civil Society Consulting, which is based in the UK. And so a warm, warm welcome. And I think it's warm wherever you might be. I'm in Lisbon. Uh, Laurie here is in uh, London. And um, Rebecca is in uh, London. Uh, Martina, um, who's also involved in the, very much involved in the planning, is in Turin. And we've got Zakla, who's in uh, um, the north uh, of England, in South Yorkshire. We've got uh, Nine Chama, who's also going to be uh, talking later, who's in Belgium. So we're, we're coming from all over the, uh, all over Europe. And I think we're joined by a lot of people who are elsewhere in the world. And you're really, really welcome to this. Um, so this is um, part of uh, what we're doing as an organization. It's called Together for Reflection and Connection. Um, and tonight we're obviously focusing in on a really um, powerful set of, of, of narratives around um, the, the problems that we see with toxic masculinity um, in Europe and in the world and what damage that causes. So that's what we're going to be focusing in on this evening. We're funded by Open Society Foundations, which is a fantastic organization that's been helping us for, sorry, uh, a van going past there, um, who's a fantastic organization um, that, that really um, wants to combat um, false narratives, narratives that are really harmful to us uh, across humanity and, and to our natural world. So we're really um, pleased to be so supported by uh, them. We've got two uh, facilitators this evening, uh, Martina and uh, Rebecca. Martina works uh, with the NOR, European Network on Religion and Belief, and Rebecca works at Civil Society Consulting. So they're going to facilitate the discussion with our two writers and with Nain Chama and Zakla uh, this evening. Um, and we are going to keep uh, the participants, uh, you, uh, muted until we get to the question um, uh, stage and we really open it up. So be thinking of your question and, and maybe even start putting that in the chat or any comments, any observations. We really want to hear that. So at about seven o'clock, we'll be unmuting everybody to, to be able to say what they want to say. So I'm going to hand over to Martina now. Hello, everyone. Um, such a warm welcome to everyone. And thank you so much to our speakers. And so the plan of this event will see our brilliant speakers uh, in conversation from now until 7 p.m. Uh, BST, 8 p.m. CST. Uh, and then we would love to open the floor to everyone here to ask questions, as Mark already said. And for our benefit, could you please either write in the chat or put end up afterwards and we will choose questions. Um, please keep in mind that um, please keep in mind questions so, and put them in the chat function once the discussion has ended. And so we don't miss any along the way. Uh, we will try to answer uh, everyone's questions, but we apologize in advance if we don't. And finally, throughout the conversation, we have turned all non-speakers microphones off. So, um, so just so there are no interruption, uh, but after seven BSD, eight B CSD, we will take in con um, con questions. And I'll give the floor to my colleague, uh, Rebecca. Um, now I've got the absolute pleasure of introducing our four speakers today. Um, so to start, we have feminist writer Rafia Zakaria, who is an attorney, political philosopher, columnist, human rights activist, and the first Pakistani woman uh, director of Amnesty International USA. Um, Rafia is also the author of three books, her latest Against White Feminism, which came out last year, which interrogates whiteness through an intersectional and transnational framework and investigates the failure of mainstream feminism and what we should do about it. Our next uh, writer in conversation is Laurie Penny, who is a journalist, a screenwriter, activist, and a very productive public speaker, and the author of seven books, I believe. Um, her latest book, which is published earlier this year, which is The Sexual Revolution, uh, Modern Fascism, Fascism and the Feminist Fight Back, examines the sexual revolution that is already happening and the choice between feminism and fascism, which, as you can probably tell, inspired the title of this event. Um, and these two brilliant authors will be uh, joined in conversation with Nain Chama, who is a decolonial expert, pan-Africanist, anti-racism anti activist and defender of human rights. 
Her background is in education and anthropology, but she has over more than over 35 years of experience in act activism, Afrofeminism and volunteering. Nain Chama is currently the director of the European Network of People of African Descent and a member of the executive board of many of the nonprofit organizations, including ENORG, and most recently elected as a board member of the European Network Against Racism. But before we get into the discussion, um, I would now like to introduce um, Zlaka Ahmed, the founder of Abna Hack, a survivor-led organization that provides early intervention on violence against black and ethnic minority women and girls. Zlaka has over 21 years of experiencing um, developing and overseeing violence against women uh, support services. And she currently sits as a board member on ENA as well. And is now gonna give you an introductory speech that will speak to the themes of this event. Hi, good evening, everyone, uh, and thank you for this opportunity. So um, in terms of my introduction, um, I suppose I just wanted to begin by saying that when I first started my working life 35 years ago, I went on some anti-racist training, which used to be delivered back then. And I was in a group with a group of African uh, uh, background women who talked about um, being black and who talked about how we couldn't leave our men behind. And I didn't really understand both of those concepts at that time. I remember coming home thinking I'm brown and also like, what do they mean about the men? Um, I then set up the Abnahak organization, which is a domestic sexual violence service. Most of the women that I um, met with circulated around were white women. And so very quickly in terms of the work that I was doing, um, I knew it was a, a feminist, uh, perspective and it was sort of very very isolated and anti-men and I took on some of those values. Um, over the years as our organisation progressed more and more um, there was a couple of things that happened um, uh, and one was in 2014. We, we as a town uh, had a report that was done and when the report came out the headlines were that uh, the Asian men within our town had been grooming white girls and we had the world's press, um, you know, from the UK, but also America, from Canada, from Australia. We literally had the world's press and I did about 30 interviews and out of those 30 interviews, 29 journalists asked me what it was about my community that we all knew that these girls were being abused and we didn't say anything. And that set something up in me because I, I was angry. I thought, what's going on here? And so when I was then approached by a, one of the young men in my community, Muslim background, um, and asked to stand and do a Sky interview, it was the first time that I decided, uh, so as you can see, I'm visibly Muslim, but up until then, the um, our organization is a secular organization. We're not a religious organization, but um, I stood by our men because I had to make a decision that as a Muslim woman, I could no longer stand by and see men from my uh, community demonized. Um, a year later, we did a feminism, feminism faith and spirituality conference because with, within the UK, we have a brilliant um, uh, feminist sector, but within that sector, uh, men are not liked and also religion is not liked. And so for me, I sort of don't really fit in with that. Um, when we were having our earlier discussion, we were talking about feminism and there was a brilliant uh, journalist who wrote an article, African Caribbean background, which was about turning feminism into feminisms. And so in terms of the work that I do, um, I'm a staunch, our organisation is an anti-racist feminist organisation. Um, I choose to dress the way I do. Uh, the women that we support may choose to dress the way they do. Um, and um, hang on, the one of the um, Rebecca, am I okay in terms of time? Yeah. So yes. one of the examples I wanted to give you was um, one of the things that started to happen more recently is that the uh, the UK government has taken on a, a number of academics, and those academics are well known, respected women from within the sexual, uh, uh, domestic and sexual violence field. And basically the research they were asked to do and put together was to be able to show the links 
between those men that commit um, domestic violence, and we know, for example, in the UK and worldwide, that's at least one in four women will be uh, will um, experience domestic violence in their lives. So the and. 90% of the domestic violence that's carried out worldwide and in the UK is by men to women that they know. And so the government asked the academics to look into research that showed the link between those men that commit domestic violence that, that are also terrorists, or the fact that those men that commit domestic violence will then go on to become radicalized and become terrorists. Now, for us, that was shocking when we heard that. So um, our organization has been running for 28 years. And to date, we have supported thousands of women to leave abusive husbands, abusive in-laws, um, less women, but hundreds of women who reported to the police on those issues. But we haven't had a single family yet that we've come across that has been radicalized that we've had to report in to the authorities. So what we did as a sector is that um, a group of us black and minoritized women's organizations came together. We looked at what the issues were and what we said was that as an anti-racist uh, stance, what the, the government were trying to do with this uh, research was wrong. So we met with the academics and we had quite initially some quite heated debates about what the potential, the potential impact of this um, of this research would be. And for me personally, there was a lot of learning in terms of what's happened in France. Um, many of the people maybe on this call will know that in terms of the French government and clamping down and closing down Muslim-led organizations, uh, initially there were some uh, uh, academics that they uh, had put together papers uh, approving links between Muslim organizations and um, extremism. So. Um, I mean, that's just, uh, uh, I've gone got over time, but that is a, a quick introduction, I suppose, to me, my work, and the, the work of my sector. Thank you so much, Flaka. Um, I would just go through the conversations right away, if you all agree. Um, and I will start with a really broad question for Lori. Just start with Lori and other speakers can jump in with that whenever you, they want. Um, really broad question. Uh, what is feminism all about today? And in your, in your view, in your point of view, I know it's really broad question. Um, in your point of view, what should be, uh, what does it mean to be feminist today? Thank you very much. And um, thank you um, to Enob for hosting this conversation. It's a real, real honor. And um, what is feminism is a massive question and it is different from what it means to be a feminist. And um, one of the things I have uh, really no more time for in my one precious life is the endless taxonomy of who is a real feminist, who is not a real, oh God, the, the feminist taxonomy wars can just stop, please. Feminism isn't something you are, it's something you do. And um, there are all different, there are many different kinds of feminisms as uh, Zaka already said, I believe. Um, and uh, some of them are not helpful. And some of them are benignly unhelpful. And some of them are at the moment and uh, over the past decade, I think have been actively unhelpful and have facilitated other, or have been co-opted into broader anti-racist and at the moment uh, homophobic and transphobic discourses. Um, you can do, um, yeah, and white feminism, absolutely, um, Iman, has, Iman has commented, but I think, um, obviously, Rafia can speak to this better, but there are, you know, I've just said I don't want to do taxonomy, but I think there are lots of different kinds of white feminism, if you think about it, but the, um, the, there is an overlap between the kind of feminism that um, locates the major problem of um, sexual violence in a racialized other and the kind of feminism that locates the source of sexual violence in say a, a, a differently gendered other and there is an overlap they're not unrelated but at the moment we are I mean at least a lot of my work in the past 10 years or more has been trying to counter these narratives that suggest that feminism, well, that sexism and misogyny are somehow an outside affect of modern society. And um, 
you were Zaki, you were talking about the link between uh, domestic violence and terrorist violence and the study that was um, that was proposed in the UK. And um, what is true, at least as far as I'm aware in the research I've read, is the very strong link between white supremacist violence in the USA and in the UK and people who have previously and uh, have, have previously been uh, domestic abusers and who also, and a great many of the um, of the American terrorists in the last few years uh, have started out have also murdered a female member of their family, their mother, their wife, their ex-wife often. And um, the link between misogyny and sexism as exactly incel terrorists and the there is a sense of like broiling resentment and entitlement to the bodies of women in general and a specific imaginary about the bodies of white women um that uh that has infested i think the kind of society that likes to think of itself as western although obviously like little star next to that we can unpack it if we have time the west um but I think the fact that so much feminist energy in the past decade has been funneled into um, into uh, like arguing about the hijab, arguing about the burqa, arguing about is there something inherent to Islam that is is I'm sorry I'm sorry for repeating all these horrible things, but and now the big debate right at the moment when they get rid of Roe versus Wade is uh, are trans people. A threat to um, a threat to feminism or a threat to women, and this, this is also completely nonsensical and even more scrupulously pedantic. And um, in my book, I talk about um, uh, well, uh, referencing um, uh, the idea of the um, the outsider rapist. And um, because I'm a bit nervous about talking about all this, the name of the person who wrote that essay, who was a famous person, has completely gone out of my brain. It's not Audrey Lord; it's the activist who was she was in jail she's in my, so can somebody help me out please the, and just the, anyway the idea of the outsider the myth of the outsider rapist um is the um the idea that like people will the only time when sexist men and misogynist men and particularly white misogynists will ever acknowledge or do something about sexual violence or acknowledge sexism at all is when they can locate it outside what is perceived to be mainstream culture and use it as a as leverage to attack um to attack racial minorities and to uh, sort of assert kind of sense of control over Tanahasi Coates has a line where he talks about uh, the bodies of white women being the only territory that white men of all classes are supposed to have in common. And I found that line, uh, he, in, it was in the essay of We Were Eight Years in Power, I found that um, inc incredibly perceptive. And um, at the moment, uh, there is a willful blindness and I think a willful ignorance among um, various kinds of white feminists, various kinds of liberal, and various different people invested in the idea of, you know, of liberal democracy as a thing that exists right now. There is an investment in the idea that fascism can't be happening in the United States or in Europe or in, in the UK, which is part of continental Europe. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, desperate to locate the source of the violence and the breakdown anywhere else, or at least to say, well, maybe there are these evangelical white supremacist, racist, sexist terrorists, but what if trans people were equally bad? Like, no, it's, and it's, um, it's only when you step a little bit outside it, but a lot of these, from about, you know, from a good many years of feminist activism now, I have, uh, experienced these ideas being making a sort of logical sense from the inside like one thing that's true i think is that many people who are saying these things they genuinely believe what they're saying they've talked themselves into believing what they're saying most of them are not some of them are just being cynical and being trolls and saying whatever they need to do to get a rise out of people but from within some of these ideological movements there's a there's an internal logic it just collapses as soon as you step outside and say but but wait a minute, that's nonsense. Like, um, 
like in Blackadder, I don't know if anybody's seen Blackadder, um, but it's a, there's, the, there's a line at the end where he, he's describing the entire plan of the Cold War and, um, in, you know, uh, and uh, mutually assured destructive, this destruction and the idea that there could never be a war if everybody just had big enough weapons and there was one small flaw in the plan, it was bollocks. And um, that's kind of the, uh, the one small flaw in the plan um, when it comes to people who have decided that at a time like this, the thing that would really, um, really solve all of feminism if we, is if we just decided once and for all who gets to be a woman, or if we just once and for all crack down on um, what people uh, euphemistically call multiculturalism. And I think that is a really, at the very best, the, the very best thing you can say about it is that it's a massive waste of everyone's time and eight. And Angela Davis, thank you so much, Iman. That was really bothering me. Yes, Angela Davis, that's who I was quoting. I'm really, really sorry. It went and it's like, it's not Audrey Lord, I'm gonna get it wrong. Um, but yeah, the idea that um at very best it is a giant waste of energy, and at worst, it's um actively unhelpful. Sorry, sorry, Yasmin, I didn't see. Well, it's obviously it's you know, Yasmin can say it, but it, it matters more when a man repeats it. I think that's what we can take away from this discussion. But um Anyway, um, I am just really excited to be here and be part of this conversation. And um, uh, in my book, I try to talk about anti-racism and feminism, um, not just because like I want cookies, although I love cookies, everyone does. It's partly just because through a, just a lot of reading and a lot of listening, it, I don't want to get it intellectually wrong. And it very much seemed to me through the reading I've done and the conversations I've had that, that a fem any kind of feminism which doesn't center itself in anti-racism or at least try is, it's not like leaving aside the fact that it's ethically wrong, it is, it's just, it makes no intellectual sense. You don't have the whole picture. Just like when people try to do socialism without doing feminism, it just doesn't work. You've missed out a whole part of the picture. You've only, you're only holding one bit of the elephant. And I do that in the knowledge that I will mess up a lot and probably get things wrong. And that is um, uh, unfortunate, but it's, uh, it's better than not trying. So um, yeah, um, thank you for holding space for that for me, everybody else in the conversation. I think that leads us really, really nicely. Uh, there's a lot to unpick there, of course, um, but leads us really nicely on the important kind of distinction between whiteness and being a feminist who is white. And I think I'm gonna direct this question to you, Rafia, of course. Um, could you possibly just go through what you mean by white feminism? So white feminism, as I say at the outset of my book, is that I don't, when I talk about white feminism, I'm not talking about a white woman who is a feminist. So it's not a racially um, descriptive care, category. It's rather being part of upholding whiteness, which is, um, you know, white privilege and the benefit that accrue to people who belong uh, to that group of, uh, to that people, to those people. So it's women who are engaged in upholding systems of thought, uh, systems of understanding, uh, you know, media depictions on and on that center whiteness and white people, uh, including obviously white women, um, as the core of what uh, feminists are supposed to be. So, you know, if you, um, if you want to visualize it, it's like, you know, a, um, a, a tiered system where white women are at the top and at the center and everyone else has to revolve around them and everything also has to revolve around them. And um, so, so that's definitions taken care of um, there. Uh, and the reason why I say that is because I would really like to jump to um, what I have found to be the most problematic aspect of this uh, discussion about feminism, particularly within the British and continental context. And, and the sort of, and I mean, and, and I'm presenting a, 
as an uh, as, as an example of how I th see things. So I'm not saying that this is how it is, obviously. Uh, this is how it appeared, at least. Um, and ask you why this is so, right? Now, all systems, systems, particularly democratic systems, say the UK, they have, um, you know, there's a realm of uh, possibility and a realm of language around which debates are involved, right? So, you know, you've got a liberal democracy, more or less, and then, you know, you have the feminists, you have people who are anti-racist, who uh, are all sort of kind of jockeying for different parts of uh, recognition from the state. And the state is, you know, democratic, people elected, etc. Um, and Within that corpus, I found that um, you know there's almost in 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 institutions that have been there for a very long time. There's always uh, a sort of little box for people who oppose those institutions, right? Which is equally institu institutionalized. So in the sense that you know you've got like. Um, you know, we don't agree with uh, the policy, U.S. policy towards uh, Israel. Well, if you want to protest, you can come here in front of the White House. You already have the space marked out. You can hold your placards. It's all it's all figured out. You know, um, the, like the, the the protesters and no the police as well. This is usually how things go within a liberal democracy. Is that you've got and everybody knows that the policy is not going to change right away, and but they still protest, etc. Um, and that is what I found the British and continental sort of approach towards feminism. Now, um, I went this crazy, I mean, you know, in the United States, and I'm not gonna say the United States is good, is good at anything because I mean, like, what can I say? We're literally out in the streets shooting people dead. So, I mean, you know, there's no, uh, I, 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 there's no uh, nasty brutish and short than us right now. Uh, but uh, there is a bit of a historical precedent for uh, conversations about race because we have had them from the get-go, right? We have had to talk about race forever now. Uh, we do it poorly, and uh, but we do have things like um, the civil rights movement, for instance, to point back to. Now, what I found in the UK was absolutely, absolutely alarming, because it was like, you had the feminist box, and the feminists were going to say, okay, well, let's remember the people who fought for suffering, you know, look at this great exhibition I've got here, the British Library, and um you know, we're, we're all pro women now, and now we're going to start talking about the hijab and all these other women that we've excluded from the feminist discussion, and then we'll bring them in, and, you know, they'll sit there, and they'll do their little thing at the Queen's high tea, and we'll all be great with that. That is the way things are, it, it felt. And in the midst of this, I wanted to talk about race. And I wanted to talk about the fact that the women who control feminist discourse in the UK and largely in the US um, are white. They're white and they believe that they know feminism best. And uh, they are in control of how the program will go, what the agenda items will be, and who will be the guests. And they are also in control, just like the example I presented earlier, of what level of protest or what level of outrageousness is going to be present in the program. So what you see then in that conversation is not any real conversation about differences. What you see is a choreographed model of uh, both of um, acceptance and outrage, right? And if you go beyond that model, it's not that uh, the program will proceed differently. It's just that the people who don't follow that model won't be in the program at all. So um, that is the problem that I saw 
you know, in the UK and in the continental, like, you know, mostly in Europe, uh, is that over um, in those discussions, and I had one with the British Library right at the beginning of the book, had one with Emma Barnett at Women's Hour, rude as ever, um, you know, but rude, not just rude as ever, but also plain dirty as ever. And what I mean by that is shove me to the end last three minutes of the program, right? And cut the part out in which I say, Preeti Patel is a brown, white feminist, okay? I said that in that show because it was illustrating the, the issue that I wrote a whole book of. But what did they do? They cut it out. They cut it out, right? And I wanted to point that out to you because the real discomfort is in these games that are being played that are very dirty. Uh, when my book came out, I'm pro-trans liberation. Uh, and, you know, interestingly, I, I think it's always, I mean, not that uh, South Asia is any great model, but in South Asia, trans rights are really not as much of an issue as they are here. Uh, even Pakistan allows you to uh, put trans as if you want as a, you know a descriptor on your national ID card uh, and I mean of course a lot more needs to be done but but point being is that um, it's interesting that when you know brown people have a a little more history uh, around an issue, uh, that part is, you know, shoved away because like we don't want to talk about the things that they might be better at. Um, so, but there, there isn't any real grappling with this problem with, you know, so then after that, they found in one week in the UK, Joanna Smith, Sonia Soda, and Yasmin Alibai Brown, all wrote editorials against my book, like literal editorials, and without reading the book, of course, because the whole definition was wrong. But I say that because that's the problem that we all confront. We confront the play dirty part of the problem. You know, we confront the part that's not being said here. Uh, we confront the part where, I mean, where, where else, where, where would I tell this? I mean, you know, the, the amount of power the Women's Hour has versus me is like, you know, there's such a gulf, like I'm such a tiny fish f swimming in that ocean that I'm not going to have any place to tell this story by and large that they cut me out and they shoved me to the end of the program. I couldn't speak, but that's it. It's, it's in who speaks and which, you know, where they are put and who is like the good troublesome and who is the bad troublesome. So that the bad troublesome never get to be part of the debate at all because they're fingering at something that is much more, you know, it hurts at the quick. And it truly is sort of challenging a power structure that does not want um, to change. So I know uh, I, I went perhaps a little longer, but I just had to get this off my head because I, I take part in a lot of these, these things and I don't see a point unless we really start, you know, getting to the nub of it, so. Thank you so much, Rafia. There's a lot, real a lot to unpack there, I think, uh, you know, and I think that's why also a problem with, you know, the, the word inclusion, I think, you know, you know because um, uh, we're, we're, we're talking about inclusion a lot, but it means that someone is deciding who's out and who's, uh, you know, inside. Um, I, I would like to know the... Uh, you know, the, the opinion of Nanchama, because Nanchama, as we said, is a decolonizing um, expert. And I, I, you know, I would like to know more about decolonize, decolonization and what it can be the role of decolonization, uh, also related and most of all related to what Rafia has just said. Right. A lot has been said, a lot of really, really inspiring stuff, triggering stuff, um, food for thought. and. Um, yeah, and indeed, there's a lot to be said in, uh, in all that has already been said now. And I always start as a decolonial expert to ask myself, you know, how can we, you know, learn the facts? How can we go back to the roots, you know? 
How can we go back to the roots? What is feminism? What is feminism? How can we go back to the roots? And indeed, we need to go way back, but way back to Descartes, when Descartes decided to separate, you know, theocracy and install the heteronomous man, the, the Western contextualized man as a center of knowledge, yeah? As a center of knowledge, and which means that he was ratio, the white man, white Western man. And of course, women were non-ratio. This coupled with the works of, uh, you know, homo economicus paterfamilias, with then exa exactly placed the man in economics, in politics, in the public sphere, yeah? Uh, completely cemented the role of woman in the private sphere, in the, in the role of dependent, in the role of being not part of patriarchy. Patriarchy was born, you know, the economics was born. And over the years, white women have been struggling right from the first phase of feminism, the suffragists and all that, been struggling against this, you know, this standard vision. If the white man is a center of ratio and women are non-rational, yeah, that means that, of course, non-Western fall in the category of the Western women, you know, they are non-rational. We can trace back the thoughts that under, underpine, you know, uh, underpine slavery and colonization way back into that way of thinking, how to dehumanize the other, how women were dehumanized. And women have struggled all along against this huge nemesis, you know? And over the years, the, the, the what do you call it? The keywords, the pep words are equality. No, we are not dependent. We are equal. No, we are not disempowered. We need empowerment. No, we are not, you know, we are not outsiders. The whole, you know, struggle to be like the man and to see the man as the enemy, to see the man as the nemesis, grew out of this way of thinking way back before even the enlightenment way back before even the whole imperialism and all that kind of crap so if we bring that all back to now to to date then we have to question ourselves why you know we i mean we have to really face the reality the process of unlearning we need to first learn the facts and then start unlearning unlearning why is it that we are only focused on these principles of the woman as being, you know, a survivor, the woman as being the, the one who has triumphed or succeeded or has won, has reached the level of being like the man, she's a leader, or the woman who is, um, what can I say, fitting in like a chameleon. Are these the three aspects that we want to uh, define ourselves by? We are either ants who can change the world if we just unite and, you know, be very strong with one another. We can be like ants and change the world. Or when we see one of us succeeding, we can pull them down like crabs, or we can just fit in, fit in like chameleons, you know? Are we ants, crabs, and chameleons? Let's ask ourselves, if we continue with this whole, you know, nemesis, we are fighting our nemesis, then that's what it will be. You know, it's, it's, it's great to aspire for leadership and for equality and for empowerment and so on. And, you know, but white feminism needs to ask them, white feminists need to ask themselves, when they are doing that, who is keeping, who is taking care of their children? Who is doing the nitty gritty, the dirty work, cleaning their homes and that kind of thing? Who are, you know, they are campaigning to be executives, you know, but if their progress is based on the externalization uh, of male domination on other poor white Western women or racialized, you know, non-Western women and of course women or uh, countries in the South, then there is a problem here. Then white feminism is precisely the toxic element here, you know, Perhaps it's time for us to consider other feminisms, you know? So people have given it a connotation of Afro-feminism, or I prefer to call it Afri-feminism. But Black women are not homogeneous. They are not homogeneous. There are very many feminisms among the Inuits, among the American Indians, among the, there are so many different, Africa is a continent which, which espouses very many forms of feminisms. And 
African women, people of African descent, experience multiple forms of exclusions, even within their own kind, even within their own women. They also have their own ants and crabs and chameleons. So Afrofeminism is, is multiple uh, and they exist within this Afrofeminism, different positions, different demands, different issues, you know? I mean, I cannot face my grandparents and great grandparents and women in my life and ask them for, you know, to be equal, equal to whom? They've got their own spaces that they are proud of and that they want to defend, equal to whom? They don't want to be empowered. They're like, oh my God, they don't realize how, how, you know, how we are empowered. We don't need their kind of power. We've got our kind of power. So we need to be really, really careful about the terminologies that we use because the terminologies frame the context. And if we keep on using these words, we create these, these kind of very limited ways of thinking. You know, people, in, people forget that feminism or gender per se, gender per se is a social construct, a political construct in many, uh, you know, countries in, in the South, in Africa, for example, gender was very, very fluid. It was non-hierarchical, you know? We did not have a problem with people who chose to have other ways of articulating their sexuality. We don't have a term for it. I was recently invited for a conference on LGBTQ, an international conference uh, with Kenya, and I asked them, start by defining to me, in your own language, these terminologies start by defining them. I don't care if you find other words to fit in with it, but give me those words. Let me see how, you know, because we do not have them. The thing is some of this, some of these terminologies, uh, I mean, some of these terminologies exist. Uh, I mean, some of these uh, ways of being, you know, uh, belonging and identity as a person, as an individual, as your existential reality, as a woman, yeah? are seen and not heard. They exist in the realm of the inarticulatable. The moment you start to articulate your sexuality, what you did in bed, what you choose, who you choose to be your partner, how you choose to be with your partner and so on, you've let the cat out of the bag and you've made it toxic. And this is what a lot of this feminist uh, discourse that was supplanted in the African continent has created. It created a problem and opened up a Pandora box that has made the inarticulatable articulatable. And it has created a problem that was not there in the first place. It was never problematized in the first place. So anyway, what I wanted to say is that, you know, when we're talking about, uh, you, know, um, Af you know, white feminism or white centered feminism, uh, you know, the, the white women tend to be, you know, they are campaigning to be less exposed, especially in adverse. They're campaigning for completely different issues. Black women are campaigning to be more visible because they have been excluded. They have been extracted. They are, they've, been, they've been stereotyped. Feminist movement is too white. It is too middle class. It is too bourgeoisie and elitist. Uh, and there's the fight for rights for women, the racial, the, the fight against capitalism, against racism, against colonization, against imperialism is not taken into account. It's not even questioned. In fact, in my opinion, I feel that uh, the goal of white feminists is not to alter the patriarchal and capitalistic systems or um, imperialistic systems of oppression, but to actually succeed and thrive within them. It is fundamentally flawed and exclusionary. The focus is on individual accumulation, on self-aggrandizing and on accruing power without actually questioning the, the, the what do you call it, the irregularities or the, you know, the underlying you know, power imbalances, without questioning the lack of redistribution of power, without questioning the lack of legitimacy of this power, without questioning the, you know, the, uh, the what do you call it, the, uh, the um, uh, what can I say? Yeah, the, yeah. So in, a, in this case, I can say that um, perhaps we need to consider other ways of looking at ourselves as women. We need to consider precisely, um, what can I say? Uh, who 
is excluded from these conversations. Sometimes it seems like we're talking, you know, the same language. And I give an example, I'm about to finish. I give an example of, uh, of names. I sat in a conference with feminists, white feminist women to discuss about how they wanted to be free of using their husband's name eh, so that they could use their own name. They wanted to be free from a man. And I sat in this panel and I said, yeah, yeah, I want to be called Nyancha Ma. I want to be free, you know? And so at the end of it, they told me, wow, look at that. We can, I mean, I had this conversation 27 years ago, by the way. And by now the, uh, the Belgian feminists have succeeded and they can now use their own name, ergo father's name and not their husband's name and their children can inherit either mother's side or father's side. Anyway, 27 years ago, they told me, wow, look at that. We are actually in the same side and we are actually fighting for the same thing. And I said, no, no, you, are fighting to be released from one man so that you can attach yourself to another man. I am fighting for my name. Yanchama is my name. It's got nothing to do with a man. I just want to have my name. Why am I linked to my father or my husband? It's my name. So sometimes we need to listen to other ways of being, other existential realities and other, you know, uh, personhood and belonging on what it is to be a woman, what it is to be a gender. It's important to realize that gender is a social construct, a political construct, which both men and women can occupy. Both men and women can occupy that feminist space, just like both men and women can occupy that masculine space. When we fight for that level of leadership, we are occupying that masculine space, whether we like it or not. So we need to understand this. So anyway, I will stop here and uh, I hope I have responded sufficiently to what was said. More than sufficiently, <laughs> really way more. And I'm just gonna go off your kind of last comments there, Nayan Shama. I, I really wanna get onto this kind of space of masculinity and you know the theme of this event. Um, obviously relating to recent comments by Boris saying, you know, Putin's war wouldn't happen if, you know, he was a woman. This is an example of toxic masculinity. Um, and Laurie and Rafia, you, you go into this a lot in uh, both your books. I just really want you to go through, um, if you can, what is the so-called crisis of masculinity and what it's really, really relating to? Who wants to, <laughs> um, Laura, um, Laura, let's go with you if you haven't spoken um, in a bit. Is that all right? Brilliant. Okay, thank you. Um, firstly, uh, thank you so much. It was amazing and I'm really glad uh, we've got uh, a transcript happening. Um, I, uh, in terms of the crisis of masculinity, I think, um, well, there's a phrase that goes around in uh, anti-capitalist activism that is uh, capitalism in, isn't in crisis, it is crisis. And I think there is a certain construct of modern white masculinity that is crisis. It's not like it requires a sense of external threat and a sense of its own fragility to understand itself. It understands itself as always under threat, always having to defend its own borders. Um, but uh, recently uh, I was traveling to Germany and uh, I've been thinking a lot. There was a question um, in the thread uh, about social reproduction and uh, Nanchama talked about, you know, who does the work of care? And I think this is a central question. It always gets left to the end, but I think it is the central question, partly because uh, what womanhood is, um, is so, um, there is a fight, I think, across um, various different countries and across um, everywhere that masculinity is quote unquote in crisis to recapture an idea of womanhood and an idea of race that ensures that somebody will do the dishes for free, basically. Somebody will have the kids, somebody will uh, raise the kids, somebody will wipe the old people's bottoms and clean the houses for either very cheap or for free. And I truly honestly think that's what so much of it comes down to um, on an economic level because feminism and, uh, and, uh, and anti-racist feminism in particular is always already an economic issue. Um, people try to pretend it's about an identity thing. It's not about identity first, it is about economics. And woman is an economic category. 
um, as well as the social construct, it is a construct it's about economics, as is the idea of whiteness. Whiteness, um, ex the idea of whiteness is all about being somebody who is entitled to take and to demand service from other kinds of people who don't get to demand it in return. And um, the, uh, the enforced, the sort of the traditional values that are being forced across Europe um, and the US, and uh, particularly if you look at someone like Hungary, are all about um, forcing women, in particular white women, um, to take on a role that they that uh, you know that fascists believe that white women should have, and that should be supported by the labour of uh, immigrant and uh, women and women of colour and uh, and the external other, which is to basically produce white babies for the ethno state and not have a job. And um, I know this makes me sound like a conspiracy theorist, and uh, unfortunately, I think it sounds much more coherent than it may have done even a few months ago. Um, there is a lot. There is open discussion of things like uh, this conspiracy theory called uh, the Great Replacement Theory, which was which is explicitly referenced in a lot of the uh, terrorist manifestos in the U.S. And it is, I mean, it's bananas, but it's um, the basic idea is that Jews and communists are um, you know conspiring uh, to create a sort of feminism that um, uh, that will make uh, white women not have babies and everybody else have uh, have more babies and thereby destroy the white race uh, that's apparently the plan um, and, and it's dumb until people start murdering each other um, because of it um, which has been happening for quite some time and a version of this um, and certainly the resentment at the heart of it is animating the far right right now and has been for some time, you know, the reports by places like the, um, the, ACL, the ACLU, the Southern Poverty Law Center have directly connected this sort of reproductive shock, the idea, was it by Anne? And reproductive shock, um, the idea that basically women have other options, real, like certainly a lot more meaningful options now than just producing domestic work for the least violent man available. Um, and uh, all of these policies, these uh, policies of reproductive coercion, which many studies have shown is on the rise around the world, they are always about race as well. Um, you know, the welfare policies um, starting uh, under Reagan in the US and also in a slightly similar way in the UK, although there is a, there's a different sort of valence of class and race there, or at least was in the 80s. The idea is to, um, well, the, the idea was to put women of colour off having babies, uh, which didn't happen. Um, what happened after uh, many years of welfare policies that reduced social security and made it, were designed to make it hard to be a single parent, was not that um, uh, black and brown women stopped having babies, it was that everybody found it harder to stop having babies. Was, everybody found it harder to have babies, which is exactly what wasn't supposed to happen. And um, uh, basically, um, that is what, I know the question was, what is toxic masculinity? And that is what it is. It is an economic issue and it is a refusal to live in a world which does not align itself to your comfort. And the idea that that is, um, that that is the same as, um, as prejudice and discrimination. And um, uh, I know uh, Rafia wants to, wants to interject, but um, uh, so the final thought is that I think a lot of what has been discussion, what has been discussed so far, and, and a lot of my recent experiences within the feminist movement have come down to a question of comfort and like the idea that people in positions of privilege experience discomfort or uh, people experience discomfort as a, um, as a mortal threat. So we tolerate, we have no tolerance for discomfort and then we tolerate abuse. You know, we tolerate uh, abuse as long as it leads to us having to stay comfortable all the time. And I don't know what, I think the only thing that makes me slightly different in that way, at least, is that um, I recently found out I'm on the autism spectrum, which will have, I'm autistic, which um, a lot of people uh, apparently knew way before me, um, which is a whole other story. But basically, I don't have one of the things that means is that I have never ever had an expectation that I would be comfortable ever in any situation. So I'm reasonably okay being uncomfortable 
in new ways, especially when it's a discussion like this. And uh, the difference in a discussion about race and racism for me is that for once, you know, if you were a white feminism, if you're a white feminist in anti-racist feminist discussions, the one thing that you can, well, that I at least I hope can guarantee will happen is that if I get something wrong, people will tell me and they will tell me why I got it wrong and it will be written down and I can go away and read about why. And that is so refreshing because the rest of the world isn't like that. So thank you for letting me be part of this. And that's all. Thank you, yeah. Lori. Maybe Rafia wants to talk. Yeah. Um, I wanted to talk about, like, look, I mean, the, the fact is, uh, people who aren't white have to be uncomfortable all the time and we can't so I mean obviously I I understand what you're what you're saying um, and I, I wonder if we could just all like maybe be unmuted because it's hard to like have a conversation if you know everyone else is muted anyway but my question uh, is uh, for the white women on this panel right because I've had obviously a decade experience of trying to explain brown women to, to, white, uh, to white people. Um, but my question about white women today is that, you know, 55% of white women voted for Donald Trump the first time around. And I think it was close to 59 or 60% the second time around, right? And um, I think the statistics in terms uh, you know, in other parts in Hungary, in other parts of Europe are very similar. It's white women who are voting for these fascist leaders. And I just wonder as to how you make sense of that. Uh, because I mean, you know, if you look at it on the page, technically you've had a feminist movement check women can work check um you know you can choose your own husband whatever uh check um but 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 then you're making these choices which uh i mean from the outside make no sense at all so i just i just was wondering if uh if the panel would like to maybe shed some light on that Thank you so much, Rafia. Thank you, Lori. Can I, can I just um, thank you very much? It's just, it's really in inspiring stuff. And it, it, you know, reminded me of reading your books on the tube and the train recently and, and, and being very inspired by some of the things that you were saying. We, if we just uh, un unmute, unmute everybody uh, now, um, if people just want to sort of indicate with their hands, put their hands up, if they'd like to ask a question, um, to the panel and link up um, with what Rafi has just said at the end. That would be fantastic. Who wants to ask the first question? Um, did, if nobody's asking yet, could I answer Rafi's question as best? I mean, the question was, how do I understand it rather than what's the answer? So thank you for that. Um, but um, I think it's racism. I think it's because of racism. I think it's um, uh, Andrea Dworkin gets a really, really bad, bad rap in terms of understanding um, uh, power structures. Um, but she, in her, she has an incredible book called uh, Right Wing Women, um, where she, which I sometimes call White Wing Women by accident, which is kind of not, not um, where she talks about the uh, the investment that people make in in. Uh, in misogyny and structures of patriarchy um, so that they can be afforded the protection of whiteness. And I think um, this idea of the white woman as something that all women and non-binary people are being judged, judged against, including white women, like there is this sort of perfect, like perfect white woman who is deserving of protection at the center of the discourse about um, what gender is and who women should be. And white women are trying to be her as well, because I think a lot of white women believe that if we're only good enough, and if we're only um, pretty enough and well-behaved enough, and if our daughters and friends are only 
pretty and well behaved and white enough, then we will be saved and protected. And uh, the trouble is that's not true. That's not how it works. Um, but sometimes when you believe that thing for long enough, um, it's uh, it's really, really hard to, to go through the, the uncomfortable work of questioning yourself. And it's it's, coward it's cowardice. It's, and also it's just, it, it's that, and it's also just, just racism. Like sometimes uh, I, I have had a, a long conversations with friends of different backgrounds recently when those things happen and I was like you know can we go let, let's let's unpack android walk in here let's let's find a let's find a way to 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 the why could this have possibly happened and they're like Laurie it's racism it's racism it's not hard I'm like but surely it must be more complicated than that and they're like nope and I think there is an aspect of like just racism That's how I understand it, anyway. Okay, if I can just add on to that. Um, um, I'm, 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 I'm really glad, Rafia, that you brought, you brought up this really interesting point. And indeed, white feminism does overlap with white supremacy, with classism, with elitism, with transphobia. You know, many white centric feminists perceive equality as something women can achieve through you know careerist endeavors and exploitation of other women and uh, you know especially those who are you know racially excluded you know from from whom they are yeah? uh, i mean it's it's like an aspiration of whiteness without interrogation you know because there's no analysis of the power of the power imbalances. There's no analysis of the illegitimacy. There's no analysis of their privilege to actually be able to, to perform or achieve whatever it is they're achieving. It's, um, it's a very singular in its exclusion and you know in the pursuit of certain goals. We can call it what we want to call it. It has achieved various names over the years, lean in feminism, corporate feminism, lifestyle feminism, empowerment feminism, feminism light, whatever. But the fact is there are certain categories of women who are always excluded, erased, denied, you know, silenced in this discourse, especially at the bottom of this filter, because there are very many filters. At the bottom of this filter is people with, you know, people of African descent. You know, black women are invisible in the media and in public spaces. They are represented in public as, you know, in stereotypical ways, you know, by society. You know, they need to adhere to certain categories of whiteness and straight hair. And this creates certain complexities like whitening of their skins and so on. They are exhaust, ex ex exoticized and sexualized. They're considered childlike unintelligent and needs to be monitored and controlled and subjugated and even dominated and not necessarily perceived as being equal to white feminists. In fact, in some contexts, they're not even considered human. So yeah, we do need to question this political instrumentalization of feminism. You know, there's, there's an author, a uh, scholar called Sarah Ferris who has called it uh, phenom mm, what is it called? Pheno phenomena, pheno phenomena, national, nationalism. Yeah, pheno nationalism. To designate the right wing nationalists, new and, and neoliberals, and some feminists, a way of invoking women's rights as a way, as a methodology, as a motivation to stigmatize Muslim and migrant men and women. So as to advance their own political objectives. Yes, we need to have this conversation because we are having a whole new field of anti-feminists and it's growing. Was that Sarah Farris? Yes. It's spelled like I put it in the chat. Yes, that's perfect. Thank you. We've got a question, Isabel. There we go. Is it, is it Isabel, do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. hello, everybody. And, uh, and uh, in particular, it's like, uh, hello, long time no see. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I just wanted to say something about um, intersectionality in, in, as a practice rather than this this thing that is a, in everybody's policies and everybody's uh, words, but as a practice of uh, let's do it together, which means that we need to be working together so that we need contact and we need to know what each other thinks so that we can challenge each other and uh, dialogue and, and move forward. But I was particularly thinking because uh, the other day, unfortunately, I was at the vigil, um, another another freaking vigil um, for uh, Sarah, um, Sarah Alina um, in, uh, in Ilford, uh, this uh, woman, South Asian woman who was taken by a, by a, a male violence and uh, you know and it's a horrible thing and we were all saying we don't want to be laying flowers we want to be growing them we want to we don't want to keep on meeting on these places uh, where we are kind of uh, mourning um but uh, at that in that in that place you know like i was uh, having a, a conversation at one particular point in a corner with uh, the the founder of million women rise um uh, um Sabrina Qureshi, and uh, and we were talking about um, about the need to, like she was saying, we need to make a call for unity, and um, we were talking in that call for unity, um, which needs to be broad, because it needs to you know it needs to be about all of us. When every woman dies, she was saying, you know, every, we should all be scandalized, you know, we should all be, you know, when anyone dies, and is killed because of uh, 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 misogyny, because of uh, racism, because of xenophobia, because of homophobia, because of anything, um, we should all be scandalized. So she was saying, we need to be, make this call. And we were kind of like trying to work out how we could do that. Of course, we weren't going to be working it out in a minute in, in an individual. But we were talking about how fragmented we are sometimes, many of us. And, and how important it is to, to form coalitions and, and to work together because, um, yeah, because otherwise like we're not gonna survive. So it's like uh, we have no future. So in a sense, it's like, uh, how, how do we, so I'm putting this question out to, to the speakers in terms of asking you, what, what do you think of this uh, premise that, that, that to, to, to grow movements in the plural that link with each other like spider webs you know or like you know grapes you know what do you from your perspective what do you think we need to do because what it feels like is like uh, we need to um to to bang on together and to link up and to find our common ground but hey big caveat finding our common ground doesn't mean that we that that is like we don't look at difference because you know a typical thing about uh, white feminism in the way, in the way in the way that uh, Rafia has described it, uh, is is like um, uh, kind of like uh, oh the, you know don't talk about difference talk about what we have in common. No, we want to find what we've got in common, but not in spite of our differences, but with our differences, which means that intersectionality in that means that not everybody is facing the same reality. We experience oppression in different ways, in different forms. And, uh, and, and that, that is a part of what needs to be taken into account. And of course, that is a very easy thing to say, but that means that for each of us, we need to be questioning ourselves, looking into da, 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 where we hold, where's the power? And where we hold power and where others hold power over us. And to be frank and honest about this thing, because like if we are not, then well, there's no future, is it? Because like you could, we got to be honest about it, you know. So anyway, I just wanted to put this uh, to 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 members of the panel, you know, to get your insights and your thoughts about this thing, about how fragmented we are, how we can, you know, make uh, links like and alliances and, and, and that they are not based on anybody's rights being sold out because like I've been here before and I've got a few years on my body. So it's like any movement that wants to advance leaving anybody behind cannot be allowed to advance. So anyway, so that's what I wanted to say.
thank you for listening and uh, I hope I, I look forward to your responses. Um, Zaha, I think you want to say something. Yeah, I suppose, thank you Isabel uh, for raising the issues. Um, I suppose it just made me think about, uh, so, uh, so in terms of Mahak, we've been going for 28 years and I'm really, really conscious in terms of being there a long time and I'll be moving on maybe in the future. But I, I want to leave the legacy of the feminist principles, which I have, which are about all humanity having uh, the same rights and uh, access to justice. So one of the things that we've developed over the last few years is, uh, and we're rolling out, for example, at the moment, is that any work that we do within our communities and with, with our women, um, we always bring in issues around disability, in, in uh, issues around different uh, sexualities, the issues around uh, trans issues. Um, and because what we find is that a lot of the generic materials, for example, that are produced don't have that intersectional approach. And yet as communities, as people on the ground, all of those issues impact on us because all of those issues are part and parcel of who we are, but usually they're sort of other eyes and not talked about. So I suppose I'm, I'm just echoing what Isabella is, is saying, that for each one of us, if we can look at whether it's the communities that we're in or the networks that we belong to and have these conversations um, and we go from there. I, I agree with you, Saha. I mean, sometimes we just need to get back to the basics. And one of the things that troubles me the most is that as much as, I mean, it's, you know, you know the concept of uh, what a bully does? When a bully has been bullied, they become worse bullies when they get somebody who's, you know, worse than them. And this is the case. Women have been bullied, you know, for a long time. And they become worse bullies, you know. And it is it is really, really important to understand how we ourselves allow ourselves very willfully to become engaged in this kind of debilitating discourse. We need to really look at the terminologies that we use, you know, when we're using terminologies such as, I mean, I remember somebody talking to me about this uh, conference uh, about the, the successful woman. I said, no, she's a triumphant woman because men succeed, women triumph. Because even when we have lost something, we know we've succeeded. We mean, we, you know, we've triumphed because in other aspects, we are doing okay. You know, we have to be very careful about the terminologies that we use to describe ourselves, to describe our cause, to describe who we are, who is our nemesis. When we're talking about even feminisms, it, it loses its point because, you know, it's like when you go to war and you're always with the enemy at all times, night and day, everywhere but you know even soldiers take a break to recruit to lick their wounds and figure out a different strategy and for me i think it's really 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 important that women start to actually go to the nitty-gritty of who are we as women put that patriarchy and all that stuff the nemesis one second aside and regroup and find inspiration within ourselves, within our own indigenous knowledge resources on who we are and who we can be. Uh, because it, it con constantly misses the point if constantly every time we, because they, the patriarchy is always ahead and they will always, I mean, look at them now. They are anti-feminists, you know? They are the ones who need saving because poor things, they are suffering, those poor masculine brothers. And we need to bend over backwards and apologize for whatever little successes that we have made. Oh my God, how ridiculous is that? So yeah, I think that we need to actually go right back into the nitty gritty. And in this case, much as the West is privileged in very, very many ways, yeah? People of African descent are privileged in one thing, 
we were corrupted and interrupted in our in our growth in our womanhood in our personhood and identity the interruption is just 500 600 years old but western women their interruption is way beyond the enlightenment they even don't know many of them are suffering from a chosen by proxy from stockholm effect wake up and find out who is the woman in you what would your great 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 grandmother define herself as a woman don't forget about all those women who were victimized as witches who are victimized for just trying to be different who are victimized as suffragists who are victimized up to today we are having this going on so we have got the privilege because our memory is not so far gone it's just 500 years old but oh boy the western feminists needs to wake up and realize that they are, they need to find out you know excavate their identity their culture their their existential reality their who they are and who they are is not based on the enlightenment or capitalism or patriarchy or imperialism or there is somebody right there let us go dig her up and she is going to be the inspiration on what the next generation of feminism is going to be thank you anchama i think that um like linking to what you said is also uh, pers I would personally like to say that sometimes it's also um, quite, um, you know, it, it's not always easy to, you know, um, acknowledging who you are. I mean, because acknowledging who you are also implies to acknowledge your privilege. It's not something really easy to do. Um, and, and, you know, um, I see a lot of times that feminists just, you know, assume that, you um, that free from 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 prejudice uh, and it's not we are all embedded in this system so we are all embedded with uh, privileges with prejudice um we are uh, we don't we are not born with sexism and racism and transphobia but we eventually became become like uh, sexist uh, racist uh, and transphobic because of the system and it's quite uh, frightful, fright, frightening, frightening, uh, and to acknowledge that. And you know, uh, linking to this, I would like to ask another question for you, all you speakers, uh, as an ending question. Um, I, I would love to have this conversation for like hours, really hours. Uh, and, and it seems like we have jumped from a question to another, but it's just because we don't have so much time. So um, maybe there's an, you know, a chance to develop this conversation in another place. Um, so I would like, I'd like you to ask how to bring change, if you want to add anything to what we already said, um, we can bring change to the world. And um, what... Um, what organizations and association already existed that are already existing in the world can bring a change and i'm uh, referring in this case of you know about enorb uh, just because i'm involved with enorb and i would like you know to know more about the role of what is existing uh, to bring change um, nowadays okay thank you um you know, it's it, it's a good question, but I think it. You know, the people who are the establishment currently have the power. Um, I mean, we gather here in groups like this, and they and it's great. I, I I'm truly sincerely grateful for it, but really, I see this as something that doesn't it doesn't really bother the people who are part of the establishment um they have got things exactly where they want them and um you know they've created even to the extent that they've created little okay well you can work on decolonizing and you can work on white feminism and um you know they they, they allow for this uh, to 
sort of go on as a gloss on what is, you know, essentially, um, you know, a, a world that is still living off the profits of 400 years of colonialism. Um, nobody really questions that. And what my, what my fear is, I have two fears. Within the UK, I've been stunned to see how saying things like, um, colonialism was really good and, and you know we gave them the railways and we gave them good education and I mean those are those are legitimate political positions in the UK to say stuff like that and that's stunning to me I mean I don't really think that we can have conversations about feminism when you know there when the, the general belief is that oppressing millions of people for hundreds of years was a good thing. Um, and the second thing is, um, you know, about um, what will happen. Uh, I mean, in a, in a lot of sense, I see this as sort of a conflict among white people, okay, about uh, white people who want very much to keep things as they are, um, and uh, hold on to the institutions and the beliefs and the power hierarchies that have existed, because of course they promise that white people will remain uh, powerful. And then there are a minority who understand that. I mean, if nothing else, if, if forget you know your character, your mor moral position, your religion, your faith. But just based on demographics, they know that that is an untenable position. So, um, you know, not to say, I'm not saying that everybody who makes an effort to speak across different has that intention, but I'm just, just arranging this within the, you know, within the larger context of the world. I mean, um, you know, a man who saw, who calls uh, burqa, Add women letter boxes uh, has been your prime minister. Uh, another man, uh, Macron, who similarly makes fun of uh, you know Muslim women, is uh, is president again. So I mean, what I'm trying to say is that it is some as a Muslim woman, as a brown woman, it's often frustrating to have these discussions because the problem is in your face. Like you don't need me to tell you what the problem is. The problem is, is that people will, uh, you know, spit in my face because they don't like that I'm brown. And that can happen to me on any street in any Western country right now. Uh, and even much, much more so if I'm wearing a hijab. So that's the problem. And, you know, the people who are not in power, which as I see myself among those, but other brown, black, um, you know, people, allies who are not in power, they can't, I mean, they can only keep telling you that, you know, this is the problem. But ultimately, I feel the goal is for you to have these difficult conversations with people around you, your white friends, uh, you know, who who don't really engage with this, or who think that they have nothing to do with it, who don't see their complicity. They don't see their complicity with this sort of oppression. Um, and they have, they have gotten used to treating feminism as an umbrella to hide racism. If, if there's something that is just curdling feminism right now, just eating it from within, it's the fact that you know women will throw around their credentials as a feminist to hide the fact that they're racist. So thank you. Should I go? Um, thank you. And um, I mean, to I agree, and I think that so often in these conversations, um, the question is, well, what can people like us do, and uh, and particularly, you know, what can women of color do to uh, to bring about the change? It's like, well, loads. If 
they and if we as like women and non-binary people were allowed to. Um, in, uh, I think one of the things echoing what Rafia has just said is for everybody to get more comfortable with their, with being uncomfortable and with examining complicity and with the idea of being wrong. Because if you experience um, the idea of being mistaken or of causing harm to somebody else by accident as an existential threat, if you cannot hear where you might need to change or improve, if you can't ever tolerate change or the idea of change, if it brings you out of any kind of comfort zone, um, that is, um, it's, it's deeply, deeply toxic and unhelpful, excuse me. I think it is very, um, uh, there was a conversation in the chat earlier about diversity and the idea that, and I have encountered this, including in my work as a screenwriter, when it's like the idea is that there's white people and then there's diverse people. And uh, no, that's not what diversity means. Diversity means, you know, that, that, all, that all kinds of people exist and they're different and you actually do honestly have to tolerate that difference and tolerate your own feelings about that difference without interpreting your feelings as facts. And I think there is a deep and profound emotional fragility within, um, within whiteness and within uh, white masculinity in particular, um, where, and it comes back um, into what was said about the enlightenment, enlightenment earlier and about the idea of like those in power are automatically rational and that men are rational. And the idea is that, um, you know, on everywhere in the world, I see white men in particular interpreting their feelings as facts and interpreting their feelings of discomfort as evidence of uh, an actual problem in the world. Like, um, and uh, believing themselves, like the first way to, one of the places to start is to, is to allow yourself and like make space for feelings that might not be rational and put them in their place and understand that those emotions are mentionable and manageable and don't have to dictate actual action. And then you start asking yourself, what can you practically do right now to change and to offer help in your daily life, not just in, uh, in broad organizations? How can you make small changes? How can you do things differently? It takes active work um, and uh, and you have to open yourself up to the up to the possibility of never ever ever being right, and that's fine because that's what it means to be an adult human being. Um, and uh, yeah, it's uh, comfort with discomfort and comfort with the idea of actually truly holding difference and like truly like rather than phrasing all conflict as a kind of war where one side has to win. Um, would be like the answers to how you bring change. I understand that's a little more theoretical, but I'm also really, really glad to be in a room with uh, distinguished political philosophers and anthropologists. And uh, I'm just, it's been a really amazing day to have this conversation, particularly considering the, um, the fact that, you know, my country in particular today has demonstrated how deeply we are held hostage to, um, you know, entitled, vengeful, white male fragility, all of us held hostage. So, um, yeah, thank you very, very much, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Um, so we're, we're trying, we will try to uh, stay in the trouble, as Donna Arway says. Um, and um, I would like now to end this really amazing conversation because we're running out of time. I also say that I, I'd really encourage everybody to to read uh, Laurie's and Rafia's you know brilliant books. Brilliant, yes. Oh, yeah. they, there's so much there that you know we've touched on it tonight um, and it's but it's quite transformative uh, and I think this whole sense of you know that examined complicity uh, and you know it's like everything isn't it examined life if you don't have an examined life, where do we? Where does that lead any of us? But I just think they are terrific books. So I really would encourage you to get your own copy and, and, and read them. Yeah. I and also, sorry. <laughs> no, I also forgot to say. Thank you so much. We we really will try and, and and look to do 
more, won't we, uh, Martina? Yeah, and Rebecca. Yeah, yeah, sure. Also, I forgot to tell you that um, we weren't able to ask all of your questions. I, I saw that someone has raised their hands. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time, but uh, in the books, I think you might uh, find uh, an answer to your questions. I mean, I don't want to be, <laughs> I don't want to know, um, you know, uh, I just think that uh, the books of Rafia and Doris are really useful to answer or try to answer some questions. Um, so thank you all. It was really a pleasure. Um, Rebecca, do you want to add anything? Just want to say thank you so much to all the speakers. It's just a brilliant conversation. Um, we didn't get to touch on nearly as many things we wanted to, but that was always going to happen with such big topics. Um, and what a great day to have a conversation. What a such a political climate that we're in. Um, so just thank you, everybody.